Good morning, Montana, and good morning, world. It's Chris Hislop from the Montana World Affairs Council. Here is day four of International Careers Week. We've had, once again, a veritable smorgasbord of international expertise talking to Montana University and high school students about opportunities in an international career path. We've spoken with all kinds of people from UN officials to military people, nonprofits, you name it. Some of those people are here in Montana, others around the United States, and still others around the world. All of this beaming to you from the Montana World Affairs Center Command Center here in Missoula, Montana. Before I kick off, let me thank our very generous sponsors at the Dennis and Phyllis Washington Foundation, Allegiance, First Interstate Bank, Trail West Bank, QFI, the High Stakes Foundation, and Longview Foundation. They help us bring this and so many more programs to you. Now let me introduce our first guest of day four at International Careers Week. Joe Shaw is a native of Bozeman, Montana and has also lived in Alaska, Arizona, Colorado, Utah, Switzerland, and Japan. His family has been in Montana since 1864. He spent his youth in Fairbanks, Alaska, where his father was a physics professor. His studies brought him all over the Rocky Mountain West. And in 2001, Joe joined the faculty at Montana State University back home in Bozeman. He loves playing music and photographing natural optical phenomena around the world, Joe Shaw, welcome to the show. How are you doing? Doing well. Thank you for having me here. It's exciting to be here with you. Well, we're really happy to have you here, Joe, because as I mentioned, you know, we've talked to a wide range of people, some people who are here in Montana, but who are, you know, a part of an international career or an international sector and surely what is happening in Bozeman and in other parts around Montana in the tech industry is really intimately connected with the world. We had the opportunity to see that in the fall when we had our program EconoQuest in Bozeman, and we connected with our friends at MSU, at Gallatin College, at MPIA to learn more about photonics and what that means. Now, Joe, um, your background um, in photonics is going to help our participants understand a little bit more from your perspective and from a four-year university perspective, what kinds of things might be available. So I wonder if you might tell us a little bit about yourself, about um, photonics, and about opportunities for students looking to get into the field. Over to you. Yeah, thank you. It's uh, it's wonderful to talk about about such an exciting field. It's uh, every every day I have a new challenge, and we're we're solving problems of very significant uh, high significance to people in Montana and around the world. I love the fact that we're talking about this, not just about photonics, but uh, about international careers and and you know doing work that connects broadly across disciplines and across types of people. I, I tried to make a list when I was preparing for this, I was thinking about it and I tried to make a list of all the places I've gone and done research in or collaborated with people. And the list became very long. <laughs> and I've been, you know, to almost every state of the United States and probably 20 different countries around the world, visiting people and doing research collaborations. That's very much an outcome of a research kind of career, is we, we do research on things that other people in other countries are doing as well. And so we end up traveling broadly. That doesn't mean that everybody in the photonics industry will travel that much, but in a research kind of position, you, you tend to do that. But, but let, me, let me back out and talk uh, more broadly just about, about the field of optics and photonics and the kinds of careers that you can find. There is enormous demand right now in this field, and that demand has been active for quite a few years, and I don't see it changing anytime soon. This is not a flash in the pan. This is not a uh, trend that is going to, to go away. It's not a fad. 
So it's um, it's the kind of thing that you can you can get involved with in diff different ways. So what are the pathways into this kind of thing? Um, well, let me back up even before I say that. Let's talk about what this means. The the world of photonics is the the world where we are trying to develop technology that uses light and controls light in a way that solves problems for practical problems for people. In my particular research, what I do is I develop optical or remote sensing instruments. And what that means is I'm trying to develop new methods of measuring something without touching. And so you might think about taking a picture with your cell phone. Um, the picture behind me, in fact, is not a cell phone picture. You couldn't get that with a cell phone, but this is of a um, lunar eclipse seen through the arms of a swirl cactus. And that's, that's one example is sort of basic optical sciences. But then when we develop sensors to solve problems, I'd like to give you, um, am I able to share? I'd like to show just a couple pictures just to give you an idea of the types of, uh, yeah, you should be able to screen share, Joe. Go ahead. Yeah, I'm just pulling it up. So I'm not going to do this very long. I'm just going to give a very brief couple of pictures. And <clears throat> these pictures give you a flavor of the kind of photonic systems that I develop in my research group. And then I'll mention briefly how these connect with the broader industry. So this is a picture of a laser beam that we, we develop. One of the things we do in my group is develop LIDAR instruments. LIDAR stands for light detection and ranging, just like radar stands for radio detection and ranging. And so you might have heard, because LIDAR is kind of a popular thing right now, so you may have heard about this. What we're doing here is actually measuring insects with a LIDAR beam. The laser that we're using was made in Montana by one of our local companies. And there are several companies that surround us that develop LIDAR instruments for measuring atmospheric gases, helping to drive self-driving cars and uh, things like that. Here's a bunch of pictures of different applications and different systems that we've developed at the university. Uh, we've done precision agriculture work up here on the left. I have colleagues that are developed photonic systems that fly on rockets for studying the sun and going into the edge of space. We do clean room work where we develop little tiny devices. These are tiny little mirrors that some of my colleagues develop for steering optical beams and for focusing optical beams. The projector that you use to look at both movies and presentations like this use technology like this. Um, in my group, we do a lot of climate measurements and environmental science measurements. And so here we are studying the optical properties of the river. We're actually very involved with doing river, uh, river ecology measurements. We're flying cameras of different kinds on drones. And then of course we go into the lab and we, we develop laser instruments. And before we go outside and have fun with them, we have to get them working in the lab. We develop imaging systems like this instrument in this white can is actually an instrument for measuring clouds. Uh, this is one of my former students with a thermal infrared camera that we customized for measuring the health of beehives. You can see these two hives. This one clearly has bees that are healthy and live and this one is dead. And the bottom right picture is a photograph of one of my graduate students with a LIDAR instrument that he developed and we're measuring clouds. And we, uh, we often measure high altitude smoke layers. Uh, what, a couple times we've actually detected smoke layers that came as far, from as far away as China, which is timely because that's the same wind that brought that Chinese balloon over Montana just recently. It's the same exact process. So, that gives you an idea of the types of things we do. These are all exciting problems. These are all problems of significance in Montana. I wanted to jump ahead and show you a couple. Uh, where is it? I wanted to highlight this one because this is this is a 
we're in Montana and this this really is a nice highlight of something that we've done that, that was of local relevance. We developed this LIDAR instrument. It's a custom LIDAR that's designed to look into water. And we put it in this uh, tiny little airplane. Here it is in the back of the airplane. We literally took out the back seat and mounted the LIDAR here looking through a hole in the floor. And we flew it over Yellowstone Lake down in Yellowstone Park. And the purpose was we were mapping invasive lake trout that eat the native cutthroat trout and thereby disrupt the entire ecosystem. So here's a map of Yellowstone Lake with the spawning locations that we found. And then here's what happened when the fisheries biologists went down to this location in the southeast arm and dropped nets. And sure enough, they found these are lake trout. The big fish is a lake trout and the tiny ones are tiny little baby cutthroat trout that were eaten whole. And that's that's the problem is the whole ecosystem is going to collapse if they let that happen. And so photonics is helping to solve this problem. So I think with that, I will stop sharing and just go back. I wanted to make a few comments about how you how you get into this field. And, you know, there's there's a small number of universities around the country that actually offer formal degrees in photonics or optical sciences or optical engineering. Those degrees are very rare. But we have some of them. Montana State University is one of the few places that have those degrees. And the ideal way to get into this field is to major in, if, if you're fortunate enough to be at a school that has an undergraduate degree in photonics or optics, <clears throat> that's the obvious way. But otherwise, the, the very natural path and the path that you can follow here at MSU at this point in time at undergrad at the undergraduate level so when you first come to college right out of high school or, or even later in life you can get a four-year degree in um, physics electrical engineering even mechanical engineering some some mechanical engineers discover along the way that optical systems photonic systems are very, very mechanical in their nature. And so there's a lot of synergy there. But the most direct paths are through the electrical engineering uh, major. And because there you learn about the electrical devices that control the light that makes photonics happen. And physics also is a very natural path. And we, we have pathways set up so that you can specialize in photonics through either of those majors. And then at the graduate level, the master's and PhD levels, we have actual photonics degrees and we're, we're well known throughout the world for being a leader in that field. Um, oh, and then finally, I guess I should mention that we have more than 30 companies in the photonics area here in Montana. And so if you are a student in Montana and you're looking for an interesting high-tech career and you would like to stay in the state, this is actually one of the best options that you have. So why don't I go back to you and see what else you want, want me to say so I don't chew up all the time. <laughs> well, thanks a lot for that, Joe. That was a great layout um, of photonics, what one can do in the industry. Um, and we're going to dig a little bit deeper onto the four-year degree and what that might mean. I'll just tell our participants that um, please feel free to chat in any questions you might have to Joe, chat them to me, and then I'll kind of curate them if you have them. Um, so go ahead and do that at any time. Joe, um, I wanted to also tell people that um, later this afternoon, our final guest will be Dean Stephanie Gray from Gallatin College, who's going to talk a little bit more about the two-year opportunities in photonics, but we're focused on the, on the four-year um, opportunities. Now, um, what I wanted to, to know was um, a little bit about those students who are watching this now, many of them are high schoolers, and they might be entering the program at MSU or other universities looking into photonics, but their entry into the job market might be four, five, or six years from now. Kind of looking into your crystal ball, um, you mentioned that the trend now here in Montana is, you know, there's uh, an, an increasing trend in photonics and in the tech sector. Looking into the crystal ball, do you anticipate that will continue? And what 
can students do now in order to ride that trend of five or six years from now? Yeah, I like any crystal balls, mine is imperfect, but I can say that I've been in this field for more than 30 years and it's been a high demand field that entire time. So the, the world is increasingly dependent on photonics, both devices and systems. The cell phone that each of you has in your hand probably right now is just jam packed with, with photonic elements. You know, the cameras, the displays, uh, the cars that you're driving are increasingly using photonic systems. One of these days, maybe we'll even have self-driving cars. There are companies there, you know, we have companies right here in Montana that are developing the LIDAR systems and camera systems that are needed to drive those, those vehicles. Uh, if you're a farm kid, if you're growing up on a farm and you want to help the farming community, precision agriculture, as I pointed out, we've done a little bit of work here at Montana State University in that area as well. The, the direction is the amount of, the amount that photonic systems get used in agriculture is only going to grow. And I can say that with confidence because the problems are very complicated. So I'll give you an example. If you grow up on a farm, you probably have heard somebody talking about herbicide resistant weeds. You know, weeds that if you spray them, they don't die. And they're fighting back. They're literally evolving and fighting back against being exterminated. And you can't tell by just walking out into the field that those are herbicide resistant weeds until you spray them and find out that they didn't die. But before you spend all that money, you can actually use special imaging systems that are made right here in Montana to reveal which weeds are herbicide resistant and not. And that's an ongoing research topic right now. And so it will be continuing. Now, let me get back to the heart of your question though. What, what can these students do to prepare for these opportunities? I, I wanted to lead with those comments because what I'm trying to say is I see absolutely no evidence that this, that this field is gonna get cold at, in, at any time. I just can't even imagine that because the world is so full of, of photonics and it's only increasing. So there will be jobs in this field for the rest of our, probably forever. The, um, the career path, the, the preparation path really is, if you're in middle school or high school, in an ideal world, you will take school seriously and take some math, take some science, you know, learn a little bit about physics, learn a little bit about chemistry, these problems are highly interdisciplinary. And so the more you know about different things, the better off you are. And I also want to say that I was specifically tasked to talk about the four-year degree path. And so I did not talk about the two-year two, the two degree path, but I, I normally do when I give these talks. And the, there are pathways into the industry with a two-year associate's degree, in which case you become a technician where you're the, doing the hands-on assembly work and measurement and calibration work. The engineering jobs start with four-year degrees and often prefer a master's degree. And then the leadership research jobs really require a PhD. You don't need to know right now whether or not you're going to get a PhD. You can just prepare to go into the field. And there are all these exit points. You can exit with a bachelor's degree, master's or PhD, and you will find many opportunities waiting. But the main thing is, I would say more than anything, you know, try to understand some basic mathematics. And by that, I mean, you're going to need to get eventually to, to and through calculus. That's the tool, that's the language we speak in engineering and science. And it's not, it's not so daunting. When I was a high school student, I was a musician and I didn't really care much about math. And I paid the price. I had to work really hard in college to learn the math that I did not learn in high school. But uh, once I decided I was going to do it, I put my mind to it and I did it, and I did it very well. But 
you could help yourself by getting ahead of the game by taking some math classes and get through as much of it as you can so that when you come to the university, you'll be able to speak that language that we all speak. Joe, I wanted to touch a bit on the international aspect of photonics and, and the industry. We know that the products that are being developed here in Montana, some are being used in Montana, but the bulk of which are going all around the world. Um, and so if a student who's watching this is interested in both photonics and tech, but also an international career, um, what does that mean in your industry? What might that include for somebody who says, look, I love this stuff, but I'm also really interested in getting out there in the world. Are those opportunities available? Those opportunities are massively available. Um, Again, if you're the if you're the technician building devices in a company, you're not necessarily the person that's going to go travel the world. But I think as you get more in as you get involved in a broader range of activities, you're going to see that these companies are connected internationally all over the place. Of course, I work as a researcher, and so I know I know the international world primarily through that through that filter, but even even in the companies they they sell to other companies they sell to customers all around the world they buy parts from companies all around the world and they are watching their competitors all the way around the world and so i'll give you an example last week i spent the entire week in san francisco which isn't international but it's still an interesting place and in San Francisco, I and 22 other, 22,000 other people were attending what's called the Photonics West Conference. And this is a huge photonics conference that brings together researchers, but also many, many, many companies, hundreds of companies that exhibit on the trade show floor. And my gosh, if we made a list of the countries from whom people and companies came to that event, uh, that would have been an interesting thing for me to do, but I haven't done it. But I can promise you the list would be very long. We would have dozens, maybe even over a hundred locations. I can tell you right now, I have good close colleagues with whom I collaborate and who I visit in their country and I'll just give you some examples. Right before this call, literally right before this call, I was on a Zoom call with some collaborators in Finland and we're preparing to do some measurements together up in Northern Finland. Um, at the conference, I saw colleagues who I haven't seen for several years because we've been dealing with COVID, but uh, those colleagues are from places like Israel and Japan and Korea and Mexico and the Netherlands. And these are all places that I've traveled to. These are places that I will travel to again. And these are places where our local photonics industries have sales partners and customers and, and also supply chain providers. Well, it's, a, it's, an exciting, it's an exciting aspect of the career to consider. I think a lot of kids don't know that they should think about that. But, you know, on that note, I should actually pick up on this opportunity to go to go up, put my professor hat on and say, one of the things you could do in high school that would be really, I think, very fun and it would help you in your future is to take some foreign language. Because we do find that we travel a lot and we, we get involved with lots of different people. Most of these countries, the people speak English really well, but when you know something about a language, then then and only then you start to understand the culture. Well, Joe, thanks for laying that out. I mean, what I think is amazing is you've got um, this four-year degree available here in Montana. You've got an extraordinary industry and sector that's growing with no kind of end in sight in the, in the growth right. curve. 
and you know exciting work on the cutting edge of tech and then you add to this this incredible opportunity for international engagement and and so you know it's a it's a great opportunity obviously uh, joe my next question is you mentioned a couple times this interdisciplinary aspect um and i'd like to pick up on that um to hear a little bit more from you what does that really mean what does that provide and how can students think about this? Because I think sometimes we get very um, enchanted by the idea of becoming a very focused specialist on one particular thing without regard to, you know, possibly looking more broadly. Could you just give your views on that? I'd love to. Let me give you an example. I, I mentioned that we have companies here that are building LIDAR systems. And so let's just take a LIDAR as an example. And let's, well, let's not go too detailed yet, but a LIDAR system is first and foremost a laser. So you've got to have a laser that works in just the right way. So if you decide, okay, I'm going to be the laser expert, that's good. We need that expertise. But we also need, once we have the laser working right, we don't have a LIDAR yet. There's lots of people who know how to make la lasers who could never make a light up our work. And so now we need to figure out how to make the laser transmitter, the laser receiver. That involves electronics, it involves optics, it involves software. A lot of the magic, a lot of the secret sauce in LIDAR instruments is software. In other words, you get the signal, now what do you do with it? When you're doing a self-driving car, for example, how do you tell if the LIDAR is seeing a person on a bicycle that you need to steer away from, or if it's just seeing a bush along the side of the road? That's going to involve embedded computers, which means little computer chips and software that's running in real time, probably with artificial intelligence, or at least intelligence built into the algorithms. And so we need, we need computer science, we need electronics, we need optics, we need to build it in a way that it stays mechanically stable. So we need mechanical engineering, we need optical engineering. And then if you're solving a problem like I explained earlier with the lake trout problem, I need to be able to communicate with fisheries biologists. That doesn't mean I have to be a biologist, but it means that I need to learn enough about biology that I know what kind of measurement to make. And I need to be able to communicate with those people on an informed level. And so that's what I love about my research job is that I'm constantly learning new things because I'm working with people in different fields. At this point in time, right now, this very minute, I am working with people on who are fisheries biologists, river ecologists, um, cloud physicists, climate modelers, and who have I left out? Um, agricultural specialists and weed scientists. I mean, it's just almost mind boggling. So it doesn't mean that you need to become an expert in all these things, but you need to have a broad education that includes background sufficient for you to learn the basics of whatever you need to work, learn next. Uh, a degree in college will give you the foundation and then you need to continue to learn. So when you enter one of these tech fields, you'll find that the details of your knowledge go out of date in just a few years. But the basics, the basic science and the basic math, that doesn't ever go out of date. And so that's why we work so hard to teach you those basic principles and the, and the skills and the habits that lead to lifelong learning. So Joe, given that answer, I'm not gonna ask you the old, uh, what's a usual day in the life of a photonics expert? It sounds like you know, it's, it's hugely varied and hugely interesting, but let me ask you a follow-on to, to this. Um, you've mentioned a number of the kind of um, academic courses or the kind of hard um, skill side. Um, could you share with us your thoughts on maybe the soft side, the qualities or the characteristics of people 
that your industry is looking for outside of the degree? Yeah, absolutely. We we find that more and more industry is asking for, and quite frankly, demanding what we call soft skills, which is being able to write well, being able to communicate orally, being able to talk to people outside of your own discipline and be understood and try to understand them. And so you'll notice that the common thread that runs through all the things that I just said is the word communication. And that's why I said that you can really benefit from studying a foreign language or, or two or three, because the more you learn about other languages, the more you learn how to use your own language too. So I'm actually a big proponent of studying languages. Um, it doesn't mean you need to be an expert writer or an expert public speaker, but I guarantee you that an engineer or a scientist spends a very large fraction of their time writing reports about the measurements they made, answering emails, giving presentations to other engineers or other customers and managers. And so you really need to have solid communication skills. And then beyond that, it's just nice to have people who have a life, so to speak. You know, So I told you I was a musician when I was in high school. I still am a musician. I have a room full of guitars right over there and they get played every single day. Not every one of them, but one of them gets played every single day and sometimes several. That just makes you an interesting person. And then, you know, people here in Montana, we, we, we all love the outdoors pretty much. I think all of us love to get out and ski and hike and fish and things like that. So that just makes you a more interesting, well-rounded person and it keeps you healthy. Here, here, Joe, great <laughs> advice. I mean, not just for the photonics industry, but just about anything that you do. And it's great to hear that from you and so many other of our guests talking about the importance of communications, no matter what industry you're in, no matter what you're doing, being able to speak and write confidently is key. Having some curiosity, some, and you mentioned the cross-discipline interest and, and ability, all of these things we've heard from you and others. So Joe, I want to thank you very much for joining us here today, giving us your views on photonics and, and uh, opportunities You know, here in Montana. Uh, but again, beyond Montana, um, what, and, and that's what we're talking about all week. Let me quickly thank again our generous sponsors at the Dennis and Phyllis Washington Foundation, Allegiance, First Interstate Bank, Trail West Bank, QFI, High Stakes Foundation, and the Longview Foundation. But wait, everybody, it's not over. This is the final day four of International Career Week. Coming up next at 930 is the director of the United States Peace Corps, Carol Spahn. She's going to talk to us about opportunities for the Peace Corps and beyond. That's followed by colleagues from the International Rescue Committee who work with refugees. Then we've got somebody from a nonprofit here in Montana whose work is both local and international. And finally, I mentioned earlier, Dean Stephanie Gray from Gallatin College is going to kind of put the um, other side, or not, not necessarily the other side, but is going to complement Joe's talk on photonics, looking at two-year degrees from Gallatin College and others and how that might help you with opportunities in the photonics and tech industries. Joe, thanks again. Thank you so much. And I hope you all find a happy and exciting trail through life. That's a great way to leave it, Joe. Thank you very much. And thanks everybody for watching. Hope to see you again soon. Bye-bye.